Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our EWD webinar series. Uh, this is a place where we can highlight uh, some of the good work that our projects have been doing. Uh, one project has been going about a year and a half, and one project has been doing about a half of a year. So we have a nice uh, look at a, a couple of different um, timelines here. So I'm for those of you who don't know, I'm Louise Petrozella. I am the Education and Workforce Development Program Manager, one of them. I'm trying to forward my slide, but having a hard time. There we go. Uh, for those of you who don't know, we are BioMade. We launched in April 2021 with a cooperative agreement. We are underwritten and supported with the Department of Defense. Uh, these are some of the things we're trying to achieve here. We're discussing bringing products to the commercial market, uh, trying to develop a robust end-to-end uh, -end domestic uh, ecosystem. And here we have our education and workforce development arm of things. This is our mission and our vision. Again, I mentioned the ecosystem being developed and actually landscaped as well. Uh, we would like to de-risk uh, folks putting products into the supply chain and, again, developing a workforce that is able to meet the demand of the growing bioeconomy. All right. Uh, so today, as I mentioned, we've got a couple of projects to highlight, uh, and I will let you know that the upcoming webinar and I'm sorry, I, I should have changed the date on that. It's actually Thursday, April 20. Uh, we have our last two projects to highlight uh, for this round. Uh, first is out of Dayton, Ohio, uh, focused on a camp for an introduction into biomanufacturing for high school students. And then we will uh, close things with our project down in Texas at UT Austin, uh, where freshmen have been given the opportunity to do some research. But today we are focused on two wonderful projects. First will be out of the University of Hawaii Hilo with Peter Matlock. You can see his credentials here. He does everything that I, I I'm just thrilled with Peter's <laughs> everywhereness. Uh, and then we will end the day with Krista, Dr. Krista Turnus talking about the biosecurity course she's developed with uh, through Signature Sci. Sai, um, and then. Each of the presenters will go for about 20 minutes. They have their slide decks to present, and then we can open it up for questions and answers. And we look forward to that as well. Uh, with that, I will stop sharing and I will turn it right over to Peter Matlock. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Thank you, Louise, for that overly magnanimous introduction. I feel like we're at the Oscars. And if I do that too much, we'll end up with 40 minutes of thank yous. <laughs> so um, what I want to talk to you about is Alakai. This is our um, our academy. We started, the, the objective of the academy is to provide education for bioeconomy professionals, the target being current or uh, identified future leaders, um, to give them a better uh, better grounding to help implement these transformational changes. Our target audience also includes uh, the community and students. So two caveats before I get started. One is I am not a deep thinker. So I'm going to talk a few things, talk about a number of things and state the obvious. Uh, physicists, for example, may be chuckling, um, but sometimes it's important to, to just use, to, to sit and dwell on, on some of these uh, things. It's otherwise seem pretty you know, uh, routine in our lives. Um, and the second is I'm going to make a few statements about Hawaiian culture. And I want to let you know that I'm I'm a, a transplant, a Holly transplant, five years here. I'm just beginning to learn what I don't know about Hawaiian culture. So I will transmit things that I have learned from other Hawaiians and generally recognized uh, literature, um, but I'm not the expert. That's why we are bringing in the experts in July. So you can hear directly from them with regard to anything I see on Hawaiian culture. Uh, it's basically mostly trust and absolutely verify. Okay, so we all know that our cultural perspective influences how we look at things, how we evaluate them, what we're trying to accomplish, and how we make decisions on what to do. And this is, again, this is the stating the obvious part, but it's useful sometimes to think about this. So think about whether you have ever been asked 
or we're the one asking what time it is. And the response of it's quarter past seven, or whatever the number is, led someone in that conversation to get a blank stare. What are you talking about? Quarter past, what do you mean? And this happened to me. I was the one asked the question and I said, oh, it's quarter past, whatever. And I got the blank stare and I realized I grew up in an analog world, right? This person grew up in a digital world. Quarter past, half past, quarter two has no meaning if your life has entirely viewed time from this kind of perspective, all right? And so, again, not a deep thinker, but just kind of dwell a moment on how did we get to the analog? Well, it comes from the sundial. That's caused by the sun. Sun is continuous. That's sort of how we gain a sense of what continuity means. It translates into clocks where the, the hands sweep across the surface. And I know, at least for me, that conceptual framework made it a whole lot easier when it came time to study things like the, what's in those boxes on the right. Those are continuity theorems in mathematics or theora. And, and yeah, it, basically, it, it, it's describing the fact that you have a function and, you know, let's say a graph uh, or a line on a graph, you can keep subdividing that line and there will always be something there. Like down here on the left with this graph, that's a continuous function as opposed to the one on the right where you get up to what's the value of that function at x equals one and suddenly there's a big jump, it's discontinuous. Well, it's easy to grasp that concept in an analog world, but think about what it means in a digital world. And, and let's go back to time to look at how do we establish the continuity of time if the only way we thought about time was from taking a look at numbers right, that pop up on a screen like this. Well, you start at 1115, okay, fine. How do I know that time is continuous going forward? Well, you might say, okay, well, let's just kind of move timeward forward half of the next unit, all right? We're here, this is 11 hours, 15 minutes, zero seconds, all right? Let's go for the next, the uh, half of the smallest units on that. Well, that's, you know, the seconds we go, and let's take half of that. So now we're at 11 minutes, 15 seconds, uh, or 11 hours, 15 minutes, 30 seconds. All right, time is still there. Okay, let's go forward another by half of another of the next smallest units. We'll go to, we'll jump to a hundredths. All right, now it's half of a hundred. Time's still there. And you keep doing this. You keep, you know, moving forward in time by half of the next smallest unit that you want to measure. Time is still there, but that's, you know, and, and you just keep doing that. And the idea is you're cumulatively adding ever smaller bite-sized chunks that you look at digitally because you're just reading it off of this. And you sort of get the sense of, well, you know, you kind of make an inference at some point. Yeah, time is continuous, All right? It's kind of clunky. I think most of us see the sunrise go over and we have an innate sense of continuity anyway. But for those who have grown up only with this, it makes it a little different maybe when you look at that continuity theorem, but it does have some advantages. For example, if you want to do digital signal processing, all right, looking at the world this way might be an advantage because what you're trying to do is emulate this continuous curve by taking samples at each one of these dots. And of course, the 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 less time between, you know, the between each sample you take, the greater the sampling frequency the more you're going to emulate what that curve actually looks like, but you'll never get to complete cont continuity at the infinitesimal level. So it's just kind of interesting to think about. Um, it's probably useful in those arguments about what's better, CDs or vinyl. Um, okay, so that's measuring time during the day. I'm gonna make a statement about Hawaiian culture and it's not pertaining to time during the day. It pertains to just general concept of time, All right? And again, Sort of trust, but verify. Hawaiians are very conscious of who their ancestors are. If you ask someone, who are you? The answer is not just you, it's who are your parents, who are your grandparents? What are the ancestors beyond that? If you talk to someone who sails on a voyaging canoe and you ask them how many people are on your crew, well, they believe that their ancestors sail with them. The wisdom that's been handed down, the presence, there's a spiritual presence. So let's say, wait, we maybe have 10 people who are physically on the canoe, but we have thousands of ancestors sailing with us. And at the same time, they're very conscious that they will be the ancestors of their descendants. So there's a circularity <clears throat> embedded in the culture 
that we don't really have from a mainland um, perspective. Kind of like, you know, once you're beyond teeny bopper age, uh, you know, the marketing world says, well, are you relevant anymore? Of course, we boomers have a lot of money, so I guess we are. But it's a very different perspective of looking at time. How about place? All right. There was a time when being able to read and fold paper maps made you good marriage material. And you could take these paper maps and spread them out on a table. You could get a very detailed one and see where your house was on the block, then the city, take it out to the state, take it out to the nation. And there was a way that these maps gave you a sense of place, right? That's, that is represented here at the nationwide level. Kind of interesting, isn't it? That, and again, maps are made basically for people to travel in their cars. But isn't it interesting that the prominent feature on this map is the roads, the highways, I, I-80, I-70, I-5, right? And you can then again extend this out to the global level. Well, okay, that's that's kind of the analog-ish world um, that a lot of us grew up in. I have, haven't seen a paper map in a couple decades. Now we have Google Maps, Google, Google Earth. And if you use them, you know, if you if you play with them, you actually get a better sense of zeroing in from where you are to what the global perspective looks like. It's an interesting way to get a sense of place, but how often do we do that? Most of us are looking at, um, we, this is how we get our sense of place. It's how we get directions off of Google Maps. These are the directions from where I paddle to a popular snorkeling spot in Hawaii. And it's very straightforward. You go up to maybe the third road, take a left, on the Lee Highway, you go almost a mile, you turn left, there you are. Oops. Okay. And that does a very good job of what it's meant to do, which is to get you from here to there, especially if you know nothing else about, um, about the region you're in. In fact, if you came here as a visitor, this would be perfect for you to get to a place in an area you don't know about. What's missing, however, in this is uh, you're not going to find anything and looking at, or you're going to find very little, you might find a click through that if you take the time gets you to the information, but you probably aren't going to find out that this is actually, you. that as you do this drive, you're going through one of the richest archaeological regions in Hawaii. It was a hub for royalty. There, um, This was where they had actually multiple, what are called halua slides. These are basically giant rock Imagine a huge rock wall that's built um, going downhill, and it's basically a straight bobsled run. Maybe with some bumps in it, they'd line it with plant leaves and someone get on a sled, and they would go down reaching speeds at 50 miles per hour to end up in the ocean. And they would have competitions with that and with surfing and sometimes combined. You can ask me about this later. You may not know that this is one of the richest areas for dry land farming that produced far more food for Hawaiians on this island than the more uh, well-known taro patches. There was a sac sacrificial heia here where gruesome things happen. It's loaded with barrel ground. You're not going to find all that from this simple digital look at place, which is useful in its own right. But if, imagine if this is all you see, think about how does that make, how does that form your interpre interpretation of where you are in the world? All right. So Here's another example. This is the beach up at the Mauna Kea Beach Resort built by the Rockefellers, the first of the luxury resorts. This is our airport in Kona. How do you get from here to there? Again, go to Google Maps and it'll tell you, here are the directions. You go up, go drive through the resort, turn right on what they call Highway 19, keep going until you get to the airport, take a right. Okay. Doesn't tell you that Hawaii 19 is actually known as Queen Ka'ahumanu, road or highway, and that she was one of the, the one of the wives of the Kamehameha the first and a fierce warrior. Um, so, you know, what a shame. Um, you don't really appreciate the context of what this is. But just notice that again, in terms of your sense of place, you know, you can turn on Siri or whatever, and you don't even need to look at this. You, you can just have your phone tell you turn right, turn left, you're there. Okay, now let's contrast that with a Hawaiian sense of place. And this is uh, this is a quote from one of the Beamer families, very famous family, been here for well, pre-contact times, as most Hawaiian, as all Hawaiians, 
um, actually a member of the family's famous slack key guitar player. He tells a story that he was at this beach with his family and some visitors came up and said, how do we get to the airport? And he decided to have some fun with them. He said, oh, the airport is just about 20 Ahupua'a to the south. And of course, they had that same blank look that when you say it's quarter past 10 to someone who's never known and, or been, been familiar with an analog clock, they said, what are you talking about? Well, this is really important when you think about uh, how you view sense of place. And this actually does pertain to the bioeconomy. Um, in ancient Hawaii, all the islands were divided up into districts, which are sort of the well-known regions like Kona and Hilo. And then each of these was further subdivided into what are generally regarded as pie-shaped, kind of messy pie-shaped wedges that went from the ocean to the mountaintop, all right? And the idea was that each one of these wedges was self-contained, enabled people to get everything they needed to survive and was sustainable. And each of these ahupua'as were, were granted to a chief, like at the time when you changed kings, and uh, the chiefs had his subjects. It was great to be a chief, not so clear, it was so great to be a subject, but the these were, and these are always, you will always hear about these in Hawaiian culture. They actually existed throughout the Pacific, other islands in the Pacific as well. And the idea went from the ocean, we'd have deep sea fishing, fish ponds, area where people could live right along the ocean. There'd generally be a source of fresh water. You get what they call the plains. This is where they do some dry land farming, breadfruit, um, uh, tea, which is T-I. Uh, then you get to the forest, which are a little more sacred, and then up to the mountaintop, sort of the connection to the sky. And the idea is every Ahupua had one of these because these were all the things you needed to be self-sufficient. If people had abundance, they would trade. Um, but it was a formula for people to live in a sustainable, self-contained unit. And it's an incredibly strong cultural theme that persists to this day. Um, again, you may not want to go exact back to that exactly, but it's a very interesting perspective to look at current problems and think of it in terms of a sense of place. These, by the way, are real. I, this is a, an old Ahupua'a boundary. It's right outside my house. And one of the things that came from this, and again, it's a cultural perspective that's useful to think about, is that sense of place, referred to as the aina, the Hawaiian word for land, and individual identity are intertwined. Right? When you talk to people about Hawaiian culture, what it means to be sustainable, they're going to say it's about the aina, the health of the aina, which is the health of the people. And conversely, the health of the people, the health of the aina. And so again, useful to think about, to look at how does this differ from how we on the main, or how um, you know our, our mainland culture uh, looks at the sense of place. And just to wrap this up, uh, this is Lacey Beach, an astronaut who was very influential in um, lots of things, including the early Polynesian Voyaging Society. Said if we create a model here in Hawaii, we can make a contribution to the entire world. This is the space shuttle. This is a prehistoric ads mine from the summit of Mauna Kea. There's the island of Hawaii. So, Louise, am I out of time? Do I, can you're I just- getting, You're getting close. You could take a couple more minutes, Peter, go ahead. Okay, so what does all this mean for our academy, all right? We started off saying we want to do professional education for people in the industry, community, and students. We ended up after industry interviews in our first session saying, yes, that's a good target, uh, industry leaders. Two themes emerged. One is high level of interest in the Hawaiian and Pacific Island perspectives on sustainability. Again, to gain the alternate insights, just to, to kind of dwell on those issues we were dealing with kind of superficially on time and place. How are we doing it? We have two sessions in 2023, this July. First one will be in Hilo called Malama Honua, Indigenous Perspectives and Sustainability. This is where we're bringing in the experts, the people who deeply know Hawaiian and Pacific Island culture to say, here are different ways to view guiding principles of sustainability. Here are why some of the ways that in which we're looking at it now, including the UN goals, may actually be misplaced, maybe don't capture everything we need to, maybe overly Western in their perspectives. Our second session in Kona is going to say, it's gonna be more of a, an awareness building. It'll be covering a lot of topics. And the idea is what are all the pieces we need to put together to make these transformational changes? Who is it? UH Hilo, Ag Business Language Colleges, the Astronomy Center, 
NSERC, National Corn Ethanol Research Center, Jim DeClo of Solano Biotech Consulting. You know him from Solano College. The first session will be at mostly at the Hawaiian Language School as well as at the Imaloa Astronomy Center. Uh, we are going to again look at the sustainability. We will look at voyaging and indigenous sustainable agriculture to look at different ways, uh, different values and ways of looking at sustainability. Here's a quick overview of the summary and you'll see that those themes are woven throughout the three days. Second session is on the Kona site at Waikoloa. This is much more of a tourist uh, <laughs> uh, destination. This is the Marriott, that's the bay where we will be holding um, the sessions. Um, this is, we're going to look to a quick shallow dive on technical business, regulatory and community issues of introducing new ways to solve climate change. This means in, often introducing new technologies and practices, as well as rediscovering old ones and how the two can inform each other. So we will include those cultural perspectives as well in a summary from the prior week, as well as begin to introduce some Native American perspectives. And so here you'll see that we have um, all of those themes built into the three days. And uh, this is Nelha here. This is actually a center for marine sustainability. Um, those tanks you see are algae, that's cyanotech, growing astaxanthin and spirulina. Uh, but there are all sorts of people here because of its unique location and capabilities of doing, uh, it's somewhere else like this in the world. Okinawa comes close, but there's nothing like this. Uh, looking at ways to, um, to basically use ocean resources and improve sustainability for the ocean. And here's a list of our mentors for that. So um, we're excited about it. Let me know if you have any questions. I do want to let you know that questions is in the font bio. So I had no choice but to use it. Let me know if you have any questions or else uh, here's our website. And here's where you can email bioecon at hawaii.edu. Wonderful. Thank you, Peter, so much. We'll hold uh, audience questions until the end, uh, but I appreciate the presentation, Peter. It was wonderful, great information. Uh, we will turn next to Krista Turnus from Signature Sci. And Krista, you are welcome to start sharing your presentation. Thank you. All right, great. Thank you, Louise. And thank you all for, for attending today to hear my presentation. I am Krista Turnus, and I work for a company called Signature Science. And I am a leading a team that was funded by Biomade to develop a training course about how to screen nucleotide sequences from a biosecurity standpoint. And um, to give you a, a quick overview of our course, this course is meant for people that are already in the bioengineering industry. So if you want to continue your education, learn more about DNA uh, screening, or maybe you're already doing nucleotide screening and you just want to learn more about it and see what else you could be doing in, in your work, this is great for you. If you are new to bioengineering, perhaps you're a student or you're just moving into the field, this is also relevant for you um, to get some knowledge about what this is all about. So wherever you're at in the movie of, of bioengineering, we are happy to have you in this course. And our objectives are for you to become more familiar with biosecurity concepts and regulations in the United States and recommendations for nucleotide screening. We'd also like you to gain some hands-on experience in this course. So what we're going to do is we will have terminals uh, basically Linux operating systems available to you virtually that you can log into and we'll have some software and databases preloaded for you as well as different example sequences that will teach you how to run through and analyze on your own and we'll help you learn how to interpret those results and upon completion of this one day virtual course we will give you a certificate of completion and endorse you on LinkedIn for having completed the course. The course will be on Friday, March 31st. It is a virtual course, so you don't need to travel anywhere. Just have a computer with internet access. It'll be an entire day, and we do ask that if you sign up to take the course that you commit to coming for the entire day. Um, we have modules that progressively build on each other, so it's going to be hard to jump in and out at different time points. And this live course is open to Biomid members as well as members of the U.S. government. If you are not able to attend that day or you happen to not be a member of Biomate or the U.S. government, but you are interested, 
I wanted to let you know that we will have an on-demand version of our course available in the fall of this year. And the only thing that will not be available with that on-demand course is that Linux terminal with all the software and databases preloaded for you. So if you're interested in the course material, we will be posting that online. However, um, we will not have those terminals open for you to continue using in the fall. So with all that said, I, I also wanted to acknowledge all of the course contributors and people who have made this, this training course happen. So Signature Science at my company uh, is, is leading the team, but on our team, we also have Rice University and ACLID. And DNA Nexus, though they are not formally a part of our team, is donating all the computational resources that we'll be using for this course. And although this course is funded on, under the education and workforce development component of Biomade, it also overlaps quite closely with the 4S component led by Beth Vitalis. And she's been instrumental in giving us reviews and feedback and contributing to content as well. And thank you to all of the Biomade uh, program management team and, and technical insights that you've provided. Uh, Steve, Louise, Kristen, thank you for your support. Um, and also during our course, Dr. Matthew Sharkey from U.S. Department of Health and Human Services will be giving a guest lecture about updates that are being made to the HHS guidelines for DNA screening. So please tune in for that. Okay, so for those of you that might not be familiar with biosecurity screening and, and what I'm talking about, um, there are recommendations that the U.S. gives for screening sequences that are synthetically made or are used in bioengineering um, constructs. And those recommendations are divided into a couple different parts. One part is, is screening customers. So if you are a synthetic DNA provider, you need to make sure that your customers are legitimate before you give them any particular sequences. And then there's another part that has to do with making sure the sequences themselves are, are safe and legitimate. And this course that we're developing is just going to be focused on the nucleotide screening portion of those recommendations. And those are generally centered around aligning the nucleotides to different lists of organisms that are considered dangerous. And those are select agents and toxins, commerce control list, things that our country tries to make sure um, we're maintaining control over and using responsibly. So that's a lot of what these recommendations are centered around. That being said, I know that most bioengineers out there are not using select agents and toxins in your work. That's not something that you're, you're modifying. I know you're not reconstituting the smallpox virus, but if you were, that would be very highly regulated and, and not permissible. And it would also be um, very likely not legitimate. So unlikely to be a legitimate use case, not okay. Let's not do that. Um, but I also know that's not what you're doing. Um, really, most of the organisms that you're working with from a bioengineering standpoint aren't on any of those lists, unless you're making something like maybe a, an enhanced version of Botox that involves some synthetic modification to the bot A toxin or something like that. Most of your work is going to be uh, in this uh, left lower left-hand quadrant of of the slide that I have here, where it's a legitimate use case. And uh, in terms of biosecurity, there's a relatively low level of regulatory control. But you may be working with organisms that have similarity at the nucleotide level to organisms on these controlled lists. And for that reason, it's important for you to go through the exercise of doing this nucleotide screening so that you can demonstrate that your case is legitimate and even in the event when you're taxonomically similar to an organism on one of these lists, you can show that that similarity is not dangerous because the function does not present any danger. There are a lot of costs involved uh, in justifying the leg legitimacy of, of constructs and sequence screening. And I think that those costs can be reduced if you do upfront screening. So when you're making your synthetic organisms, when you're doing your different um, bioengineering experiments, if you look upfront at the nucleotides that you're using and screen them, that can help to reduce costs and time later on in case anyone comes to ask you questions about it. You'll have those answers ready and those results ready to really justify the legitimacy of what you're doing and, and answer any questions that regulatory agencies or customers or others may have. 
And it's also a nice way to show yourself as a scientist that everything that you're doing is safe and um, okay to use. However, even though that this is a great idea for reducing the, the time involved later on in answering questions and, and costs involved in that, there's not a single standardized method for sequence screening. So although our country has recommendations for how to do this, those recommendations are really at a high level and there's not a software package that, that our country points to and says, hey, please use this to screen all your sequences. And so because of that, people that are not familiar with this can feel intimidated about how to do this. There's some questions about how do I even begin to approach this kind of an activity. And there's also not a lot of training courses out there. I really don't know of any training courses out there, which is why this one is so important. I think education is a, a big part of the solution here and getting more people to be able to screen sequences. And um, we hope that we'll make a step in that direction. If you're interested in implementing sequence screening, you have a few different options. And I think wherever you land on this map, this course will be interesting to you. And if you are a bioinformatician or if your company or research group has bioinformaticians on staff, they may be running in-house tools that you've developed to do the sequence screening. If so, I think this course will still be interesting to you because you'll be able to see what kind of tools we're running, what kind of example data sets we're using that you're welcome to use in your own testing and development work. Um, I think there's a lot to be learned from each other in this space. So please come and, and learn from us and talk with us about your thoughts and, and see what we're doing. If you are a biologist who is interested in interpreting outputs from software, but perhaps you're not a bioinformatician, so you're not going to build the software yourself, I think you'll be interested in this. You can have some experience running our open source software at the command line and see if you like doing that. If, if you feel comfortable doing that in the future, you can apply that to your work and then just learn how to interpret the results of the software. Uh, but even if you don't like our software and you decide you don't want to use it, you want to go to a, a commercial software platform, I think this is still going to be useful for you because the concepts that we're using to screen the sequence is um, is universal, regardless of what software solution you use. These concepts are all going to be the same. So conceptually, it's a great idea to learn this for interpreting results from any software package you end up using. If you are someone who just wants to outsource this whole thing, you don't want to run the tool yourself, you don't want to learn about the methods, so the detail that would be needed if you were going to build it yourself, and you don't really want to interpret the outputs, you want to pay someone to do all that for you, I get it. You know, it, it does take some, some time to learn these things, but I still think it's worth learning and attending this course so that you can understand the general concepts involved in what you're paying someone to do. You know, just like anything else, if you're paying someone to do a task for you, you should understand it to the point that you can evaluate what's being done and make sure that they're doing things um, credibly and, and to the degree that you're hoping for um, to get what you paid for. So it's good to conceptually understand what's going on here. Uh, regardless of what level you want to dive into sequence screening. All right, so jumping in to, to how sequence screening is done, a lot of it revolves around taxonomic classification. So that's saying I have these lists of organisms that I know I need to screen for and I'm concerned about. Let me see how similar my sequence is to those organisms that I'm concerned about by aligning the query sequence to these genomes or toxin uh, sequences. And in doing that, then you try to place the query sequence in its most likely species bin. Uh, th the challenge here is that many of these species have sequences that are very similar to each other. In some cases, they're identical. So there can be genes shared among the Bacillus genus or the Bacillus serious group that are equivalent across organisms like Bacillus anthracis, which is a controlled organism, or other organisms that are not controlled. And it becomes important then to think about the function of the gene that you're analyzing and whether or not that's contributing directly to pathogenicity, because taxonomically, it may have an equivalent match across many different species. And actually, in the case of Bacillus subtilis, that is definitely an issue, right? For those of you doing bioengineering with that organism, you know that a number of those sequences match to Bacillus anthracis. So it becomes important to make sure that you're demonstrating that the sequences you're using are, 
are not contributing to pathogenesis or the bacillus anthracis toxin or anything like that. And that's where functional classification comes in. So in this course, we're going to be using software called SeekScreen, which gives taxonomic results as well as functional results. And within our software, we assign function through a custom ontology we developed called Function of Sequence of Concern. And that is described in the publication here on the left that you're welcome to go read more about. Uh, we also discuss it in our SeekScreen publication. And then we have the pathogenesis gene ontology terms as another set of terms that we use to classify function. This was developed uh, by Johns Hopkins University with some collaboration from my team at Signature Science. And the functions of sequences of concern are a much higher level description of how pathogens can harm the host. The pathgo terms get much more detailed. Uh, within SeekScreen, we have 32 fun socks and um, around 150 or so path code terms. The fun socks are assigned by machine learning within our software, which means that there's a huge breadth of assignment of fun socks across all the possible proteins that it could be analyzing. So everything will get a binary yes, no for those 32 fun socks because they've been assigned by machine learning to every query sequence. Everything's gonna get a yes, no. Um, with the path go terms, those are not present on every query sequence because those are actually manually being assigned by human subject matter experts and added to our database. And when they're added to the database, they will have the path go term assignment, as well as a reference to the publication that has the experimental evidence at a functional level for why that particular term was assigned. So this is a similar uh, concept as is followed by the Gene Ontology Consortium and Uniprot, where if you're going to assign a standardized label that describes function to a sequence, you have to justify it with a literature reference that describes experimentally why this function is known to be present. So that's the model we follow here. Um, the pathgo terms, I have much higher confidence when I get a result with a pathgo term, because I know that's been reviewed by a human subject matter expert, has uh, literature support. With machine learning, I think we did our best to make sure that that does a nice job, and we dropped out any terms that didn't have good results from machine learning when we were deciding which of the fun socks to include in the software. But, but it's not perfect. Um, and, and so that's just something to keep in mind when you're analyzing results from our software that the fun socks come from machine learning results, the path code terms come from a human subject matter expert annotations. And our software will output both HTML and TSV reports. So when you take our training course, we'll take a look at both of those outputs. All right, so now let's go through a couple examples just to better illustrate why all this information is important and how you could use it to analyze a sequence. In this example, we took the first 210 base pairs of the bacillus anthracis gene that's involved in the TCA cycle. So this FUMC gene is part of the larger glucose metabolic process. This is a, a metabolic gene. It's not going to do any kind of harm to anything. It's just how this microbe basically eats and stays alive and, and stays happy. It, it's not going to cause harm to humans or anything else. So when we analyze this section of the gene, we see in our output here that um, the, the sequence has been assigned to Bacillus cereus, which is interesting because it came from Bacillus anthracis. But this is an example where it was an equal hit between Bacillus anthracis and Bacillus cereus. So here we, we can click on the query sequence and see the alignment that the protein had. And it's a perfect alignment to, to Bacillus cereus. And if we look deeper in the results, we can see that it also had a perfect hit to a number of other bacillus species. So this is an example of a gene that's conserved across a number of uh, species within the bacillus serious group. And we see that it had a match to BSAT. So that stands for biological select agents and toxins. And that is because of its similarity to Bacillus anthracis. So this is something that might raise a flag in your sequence screening because it does have a hit to the BSAT organism. However, when we look at it deeper in the results, we can look at the, the go term visualizations and the go term lists. And those gene ontology terms are um, not specific to pathogenesis. Those describe 
just all different functions in biology. And we see here that it's a primary metabolic process. And if I can just show you these results, um, since this is more interactive, you can see the primary metabolic process. You can also go up or down on the chain of, of the ontology to see it's a metabolic process. It's a, a TCA cycle. There are different things here that you can interact with. And um, the functional report that you're looking at looks like this. And this is the part that you can click on and see the alignment. Um, this is the part that you clicked on to get to the go term. You can see the actual sequence if you click here. And then if you scroll over, this is the column that tells you whether or not it hit to a BSAT organism. These are the fun socks across the top. If you uh, hover over these little question marks, that'll tell you what the definition of the fun sock was. Um, we're hoping that the, the shortened words that we use for the fun socks are informative to tell you what, what they are. But if, if it's not, please you know read the definition and, and get a better sense of what we're talking about here. In this case, there are no fun socks assigned. So we're looking at this top row in this example, and we see a bunch of zeros. So that means that there were no functions of sequences of concern assigned by the machine learning algorithm here. If there was a, a function of sequence of concern, it would be labeled as a one in that, that column. And within the TSV report, which is much more challenging to show you in this form, but we'll just quickly look at it and then put it away. So this is the TSV report that's output, and you can see here that basically this is parsable by a computer, or you could copy and paste this into an Excel file, and it would be a little bit easier to read. But within that, we have the different path code term assignments um, for, for this particular sequence. And I'll jump back over to my slides. Um, yeah, so, so no path code term assignments, no fun stock assignments here. If we want to then look at a, an example on the opposite end of the spectrum. So this is one of the proteins involved in the anthrax toxin. So this definitely has a pathogenic function. It is on the controlled list. So if you are accidentally using this in, in your bioengineered product, it should be flagged as dangerous and, and you should know about it. That's the goal. So um, in doing this, we see that uh, it's definitely assigned to Bacillus anthracis. This is a sequence that is going to be unique to, to that species. So it should not be equally assigned to multiple members of the Bacillus series group. And then we also can see that it had a number of FUNSOC assignments and PATHGO term assignments. And remember that FUNSOC and PATHGO term assignments are, are all specific to pathogenesis functions. So if anything shows up there that it, is a fun sock or a path code term, we know that this organism or this sequence has something to do with pathogenesis. And you can definitely read more about the fun sock definitions and the path code term uh, descriptions. And you can also look at these PubMed IDs for path go to get more information about how this sequence might be pathogenic. And um, if you are not familiar with PubMed, I'll just show you a, a screenshot of that here. So basically, you can enter that number in here that came after PMID, and here being the internet and a PubMed website, and that'll pull up the, the publication that our subject matter expert annotated there to correlate with that particular PathGo term assignment. And that can be helpful for you to, to just learn more about what they thought was involved in um, the pathogenesis of that sequence. So with that, I will wrap up and I will say, please sign up for our course. We would love to have you. Um, we do not have an infinite number of slots for this course, even though it is virtual, because we wanna make sure that we're working well with you and we're gonna be having everyone run things in real time and analyze results. So we wanna make sure we have um, enough bandwidth to answer everyone's questions and get everyone up and running uh, on their, their terminals, but we do have a lot of spaces open right now. So sign up now while there are still spaces open. And if that doesn't work for you, I also encourage you to keep an eye out for on-demand uh, materials, which will be available later this fall. Great. Thank you. That's great. Thank you, Krista. Um, I think we'll uh, move forward here a little more casually, rather than putting questions in the chat, um, if you all would like to come on camera again, you can ask Krista and Peter questions directly. Krista, my mind is blown. I am really 
impressed with what you have done and how you are putting this course together. Um, I'm wondering, first question kind of out of the box for me, I mean, is it appropriate for a lay person like myself to, to would I benefit from sitting in that, that course? Would it at least introduce some fundamental concepts that I can familiarize myself with when I'm just now starting to learn about some of this uh, topic? Absolutely. Yeah, I think conceptually, these concepts are important to everyone in the bioengineering community, because it is something that we're all being encouraged to do, just to make sure the products that we're developing are safe. And if you attend the course, we will make you participate. So you will have to learn how to run the software. You can't just hang out. But it's a good thing to learn. I think it's wonderful, you know, to get your hands in there and to try to learn how these things work, how to interpret results. And even if you're never going to use that because that's not part of your job, um, it's still just a nice thing to know so that when you meet people that that do that, you have an understanding of what's involved and what they do and and that it's an important com component of our, you know, biomanufacturing community. That's great. Thanks, Krista. And I know Chris Deckard is on the line, one of our uh, federal government partners. You know, the Government folks have been asking to kind of beta test a lot of the uh, products coming out of these projects. So hopefully Chris can uh, help to spread the word about getting uh, folks to sign up for the class. Yeah, I already did that just now. Thanks, so. Chris. <laughs> thought you might have. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll open it up. I, I won't, don't want to dominate here. So folks, ask away. Hey, Krista, this is Tom. I'm just going to jump in here with a, with a, a comment and um, a possible avenue for because I think that the work is fantastic. And so thank you and the team for all the hard work with putting the coursework together. Um, thinking about the cohorts that are coming together that take the course and the continual support flow, and maybe for the group itself and for others who are taking the course in the future, um, now that we have the Biomade portal open, establishing, you know, suggestion is to establish a internal um, interface within the portal that will allow people to communicate about the course and some of the content and help to work and navigate through the system. But I think that, that there are multiple moving parts here that can come together in a really fluid way um, to really escalate and, and elevate the, the, the work that you've done and the work that we can do in the future. So thank you very much. Um, Peter, I have a question for you, um, sure. and this is more of an extension of the uh, learnings um, from Alakai. And uh, you know, thank you for your introduction with the time and and the framing of this, and it, it made so much sense, and it, it made me think about things in a little bit different context. I'm wondering if you can extend your own perspectives and um, provide some uh, some ideas about how you think your learnings from uh, Native American and uh, Native, Native Hawaiian populations can potentially be adapted or uh, utilized to understand other cultures such as those uh, for our Native American populations? Yes, no, it's a great question. That's actually why, um, I mean, so, so there are a couple steps to that. I mean, one is first saying, oh, there is benefit to thinking differently about how we approach these problems. And that's one of the things that I was, that we want to convey in this first set of, um, of sessions. Actually, it's the second we did, we started last summer. Um, and, and that's why we're doing a deep dive uh, the first week on the Pacific and Hawaiian Island, just to get some definitions there that are Pacific oriented on what it means to be sustainable, what are the values, how can we think about this? You'll note in the second week that we have invited Marty Matlock. No relation that I know, I mean, other than biblical <laughs> or distant. Um, who's a really interesting individual. Uh, he's at the University of Arkansas, part Cherokee, grew up on a reservation, has been doing fantastic work, senior advisor to USDA, Intertribal Council on Sustainable Agriculture. And so in that second week, we want to start taking the first steps to that in terms of summarizing what do we learn about the Pacific perspective? Oh, interesting. Now, how does that relate to the Native American perspective? Um, and start trying to gain some of those insights. That, however, does not really answer, I think, what your question is, which is, is there a process or a mechanism that we can engage in repeatedly to try to convey this type of, it's a little more philosophical approach to how are we going to approach sustainable solutions, right? And, 
and 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 I got to be honest, I don't really know quite what if there is what that mechanism is, other than to keep addressing the problem. Um, we think that what we have is is going to be a useful way for people to come to Hawaii. By the way, I encourage you all to, to register. Uh, I'll put the I'll put our web page in the um, in the chat box in a minute. Uh, we don't have the for the formal registration should be online in about a week and a half. Uh, in the meantime, you can email bioecon at hawaii.edu. I'll put those in, and I will make sure you get updates on further information. But but that is right now my best answer for what is that mechanism is to get people together, make you know, let's appreciate why it matters, and then let's have the discussion. Let's see what other perspectives are. And then the trick is, and this is really critical, so many top people here talk about how do we look at um, sort of the indigenous Hawaiian practices and tie that, you know, see how that can inform contemporary technology and vice versa. And it's a really, I hear a lot of words. Sometimes you see people that are doing interesting things. I think it's still fertile ground to solve because I don't think anybody's really cracked the code on that. And so this is our attempt to try to move that ball, you know, move that forward. So um, can I jump in here too, Peter? Yes. Yeah. So uh, Tom, this has been a, a fascinating project for me, uh, especially interacting with uh, the indigenous Hawaiian uh, culture that what, uh, and every week something new comes up, but what, what, someone said, and, and Angela is communicating this, if you look at the UN definition of sustainability, it's a Western definition. It is a European definition. It is, and the Hawaiian point of view involves involvement of the community more. It involves family more. It involves, mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it isn't technological. It, it's really, it's more sociological. And it's the sociological part is different than this Western view of we can beat this with technology. You can't beat it with technology. You have to involve the community. And uh, that's what's been fascinating to me. Hawaii is a, a, a very um, complicated, uh, bringing the <laughs> bioeconomy there. Uh, as Peter says, there are layers upon layers upon layers. And uh, again, uh, uh, involved in that is a feeling of uh, uh, colonial exploitation and also uh, ecological uh, threats throughout their history. You know, the, the introduction of exotics has just brutalized uh, the native population of wildlife. And with, with that, it, I, I think, uh, we have um, a lot to learn from Hawaii, but what, what's tricky there is that you say, I'd like to learn from you in a way that doesn't communicate, oh, here's another way that we're going to be exploited. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, it's, um, it's, very, it, it's very nuanced, very layered. And uh, uh, from, from the day one, that uh, the, the whole inspiration to the Hawaiian Renaissance was the, uh, the building of the original canoe and celestial navigation using uh, traditional celestial navigation to go to Tahiti. And uh, what they said is when you go on the canoe, you have to fundamentally change your point of view. You, uh, you can't have conflict because your life is on the line and it's, and it's, uh, it's, it's so small, but when you get off the canoe, you say, okay, um, uh, the, the island is a canoe because uh, you do have limited resources and you can't have conflict because it's so small, but then uh, there's a Hawaiian expression, the earth is a canoe. And I, I don't know, it, it's just, the, the entire philosophy, I've learned so much from this project. And I think uh, if we communicate this properly, uh, that uh, the indigenous Hawaiian culture has a lot to teach us about sustainability, but thanks, it is different. Jim. Yeah, thanks, Jim. It's, it's, been, it's been wonderful witnessing the evolution of this project and 
how things have kind of uh, responded, you know, as you learn more, the project changes just a little bit to, to really be more impactful. I see that Chris has her hand up, Chris. Yeah, I, I just wanted to um, ask Peter and, and Jim, um, if you are, um, so it kind of goes to the same similar question that uh, Tom was posing, but I think one of the things, are you, are you keeping track of like lessons learned on how to engage, right? And, um, and, and as Jim just said, right? So that it comes across not as, oh, we're gonna exploit this or we're here to, to do harm or, or, or even to the point of we're here to just because we should, you know, because it's a box to check, right? Um, how, how, you know, so I'm hoping that you're doing that. The Army has a, has a program that they're working with the um, Navajo Nation um, up in Utah and in Arizona, but, um, you know, and they're going in and they had to learn a lot of things and it would be really beneficial if all the, all these um, efforts that are looking into these cultural things, right? I think that's where maybe there's some commonality it's not that, oh, we can just do exactly what we're doing with the Hawaiians, but it's that, hey, here's how we first made, you know, engaged and made contact and, and the listening and that, and that would be really useful um, to me. And I think to all of us as we move forward, because we do want a diverse mm -hmm. way of thinking. Right. Yeah. And, and it's not just, you know, as you put, you know, the analog way or the digital way. Right. I mean, we need to make sure that we're we're looking at that. So I just kind of wanted to throw that out there. I know we're kind of out of time, but um, just hoping yeah. that we're that maybe that's something that would come out of this over. Mm -hmm. Thank, thank you, Chris. Yeah, I want to, as Chris mentioned, we are out of time. I do want to be respectful of everyone's time here. Uh, Peter and Jim, if you could muse on that a little bit as far as uh, Chris's inputs. Uh, we certainly have opportunity to continue talking about these projects. Uh, don't feel as if we need to formally, you know, come together via webinar. You can contact me, you can contact Tom, whoever's on the line here for, for the questions. Um, again, thank you, Chris, for that last re you know few remarks. Uh, I do want to wrap up again, being respectful of everyone's time. I really appreciate everyone gathering for the webinars that we've had. Just a couple of reminders: we will have our next and final webinar for our current EWD projects on Thursday, April twenty. So all of you are welcome there. We do have our member meeting coming up the end of April 26th and 27th, 25th, 26th, 27th, pardon me, 27th, our committee meetings. I encourage strongly everyone, please come to Minneapolis. It's fabulous. Uh, again, have a wonderful afternoon. Take good care. Special thanks again to Peter and Krista, and we will keep moving forward. Thank you all for attending today. Bye-bye.